Greetings, Art History One, from our lovely symposium here in Greece, just outside the Parthenon. Like we are, our class will do um, this week, we'll par hold part of our class outside, just like the ancient Greeks held their classes outside, where the great minds of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, where they actually learned and questioned the nature of reality. Before we do that, we want to move inside and show you what architecture would have looked like on both the interior and exterior of ancient Greek buildings. And our lecture today then will be on the Parthenon and on other buildings and architecture of ancient Greece. Enjoy. Now, Greek architecture, just like Greek sculpture, deals with the idea of perfection, but it's visual perfection. It's that everything needs to be perfect in every different capacity. So just like they altered the size of the head for the male body, and they took away one of the vertebrae in spear bear and Aphrodite of Canidos, what you see looks perfect because it's supposed to be visually perfect. Your eye plays tricks on you. The Greeks knew this, and they're going to accommodate for this. And we will see this actually in a couple of the different artworks that we show. Optical illusions are going to be a play a part of their perfection. Later on, the Romans, who believe in mathematical perfection, are going to make fun of the Greeks for some of their architectural monuments and what they did. So on the left up here is the Parthenon by Ictinos and Callicrates, and the sculpture on the inside is by Phidias. Remember, last time we mentioned Phidias um, and specifically talked about the gold and ivory sculpture of the statue of Zeus at Olympia. He also does the Athena in gold and ivory inside of the Parthenon. And the, the building on the right is by Epidaurus Theater. It is Polyclitus the Younger. So this is Polyclitus' son, the famous sculptor of the spear bear. We're just waiting for our slides to upload here. There we go. One of the things that we need to figure out when we're looking at architecture for the first time, which you may have never considered before, is what do we consider when we are analyzing architecture? What is it that we are actually looking at when we, when we analyze it? So the first thing is going to be context, the environment and the location. Whether that happens to be our beautiful Parthenon, which is now in ruins, but was beautiful in ancient Athens in the fifth century, or whether it happens to be the Eiffel Tower that you see here. The Eiffel Tower was a monstrosity when it was made. We often consider it one of the most beautiful, elegant buildings in the world today. But 10,000 artists, architects, and citizens signed a petition to stop this odious building, they called it, because it's so different than anything else in the classical or French style of architecture. They basically said, oh my God, it looks like a machine factory, a chimney stack for the industrial age is out. No one had developed that particular style or interest or love of architecture yet. The form, the overall shape of a building, something we'll talk about, for example, the Eiffel Tower is a tower. It's basically man against nature, where man is trying to defy the laws of gravity. Line, the use of straight curvilinear or angled shape to move the viewer's eyes around a building. Note with the open work, what's called lattice, the open work on, of the, um, the Eiffel Tower, even though it's so huge and dominant, you get this feel of this airiness in these pockets. You look through and see where you can see the sky in the background. The idea of repetition, the forms repeating over and over that give balance. Scale, how large is it? The Eiffel Tower set out to be the first building in world history to reach 1,000 feet. And they did it kind of ad hoc because they added a radio tower that was 26 feet on the top. They put it at 1,010 feet. The actual building was a little under what they were planning. The space, the design and flow of spaces for function. Again, this goes along with the idea of some use of those forms, those open lattice work, which makes it really beautiful, but also very, very supportive. And style, the historical framework. Here, we have the idea that this is an artwork and an art, new art style using machine riveting and steel girders that had never been done before, except in factory work at a much smaller level. So the audience that had seen this unless they were working in a factory, had never really seen this type of architecture before. It shocked them. So what do building mean? Let's run through some different shapes of buildings. First off, we're gonna have what we've seen before, but never called this, this before. It's called the Sacred Mountain. 
This is a shape that basically communicates across sacred dimensions of earth and sky. We're basically making mini mountains. Remember, most of our gods that we've seen and will see in future classes, they live up on mountains. There's Mount Olympus for the Greek and the Roman gods. Um, we had that the, um, the Egyptian gods live up in the heavens. We have that the Mesopotamian gods live up in the heavens and they descend down to meet us on the top of mountains. But not all of us, only those people who are worthy. Gothic, Gothic cathedrals at the end of Art History 1, they're going to reach and try to get higher and higher and higher to eventually they're reaching up towards the heavens. That is what we're doing with the sacred mountain. The column and beam, or what's also called post and lintel from Stonehenge, but columns are fancy forms of posts. Practical, worldly form, which organize man-made architecture from nature. And so it's a very practical, it's a human form. We come up with the scale, the mathematics that actually show this, whether that's in the Parthenon or in our own US Supreme Court, which is based upon some ancient Greek and Roman models. We have the tower. This is man dominating nature. This is, look what we can do. Look how large we can make our buildings. The Eiffel Tower is that first building that makes it over a thousand feet. It is the largest building on earth for only about 40 years until the Empire State Building opens up in 1932. Remember, before the Eiffel Tower, the tallest building on earth was? That is correct. It is still the pyramids from ancient Giza at about half the size at 480 feet. So it took us the better part of two and a half thousand years and building a new architecture style to make something larger and more magnificent than what the ancient um, Egyptians had done with the pyramids at Giza. It's a fa fantastic accomplishment. The Empire State Building remains the largest building on earth, also for about 40 years. And then my hometown of Chicago, the Sears Tower passes it. And then 40 years later, we have Burj Khalif, which is now the tallest building in the world, which basically reaches up a quarter mile in the air. It's a spectacular um, building in Dubai. It's gorgeous at the United Arab Emirates. I've been fortunate to actually see it on a trip that I had. One of the things that shows up within it is that it's amazing because it's built on sand. We made something that basically is built, in, built on something that kind of moves through your fingers. It's a pretty remarkable building and building achievement on what we're able to do today. Again, we live and we are a pretty cool species. And finally, we're gonna have the arch, one of the greatest human inventions as it soars in the air, but it also returns to earth. And so it takes the heavens as well as the sky and puts them down on an earthly kind of costume. So we're gonna see this in very, very beautiful buildings and architecture, particularly many of them dedicated to the gods. And the dome. Once we develop the dome, and it takes us to the Roman period, so we won't see it here in ancient Greece, but in our next culture, it's the dome of heaven. It symbolizes the perfection of the heavens and the gods. And once this gets created, we use a lot less arches in our religious buildings than start using a lot more domes as the sacred holy space of the perfection of man and God coming together. This is going to play out. We're also going to see this in religious, um, besides religious, in political buildings such as the U.S. Capitol. Now, the thing that may surprise you, but it really shouldn't if you think about how humans orient their own world, is that architecture has always been based upon the human body's experience in the world. And so the size, the proportions, the shapes of different types of architecture, as we'll look at today, are based still on the human experience of that architecture as well. Part of this is the fact that the Greeks themselves live almost all of their lives outdoors. Even their lovely classrooms would have been outdoors rather than indoors. If it rained, they would go underneath a tree and a, uh, a master, excuse me, a master teacher, a master philosopher would stand on this large marble circle and actually be able to talk and give the sermon. Whether that happened to be Plato, Aristotle, um, Socrates, Diogenes, any of the ancient Greek philosophers. The most famous building from ancient Greece is what I am currently in front of. And you note an aerial view um, both from a reconstruction and for when the status of where it currently is, it's being rebuilt, is the Acropolis with the Parthenon. So the Acropolis is the giant walled city. The Parthenon is the building dedicated to it being all the way at the top. And as we look at Greek architecture then, there's certain features that we actually want to focus on. And we don't need all of these, 
um, if you take an introductory architecture course or an architecture major, you might, might want to pay particular note. But otherwise, we're going to just look at a few of these features that show up um, that's laid out here. One thing that we are going to look at, and one of the most important features, and for us, is going to be this area right here on the top of the columns. The top of the columns is called a capital, and that is the Greek word for head. So already the column itself is representing a body where the capital represents the head, no matter what order, whether that's Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. And hopefully from your readings, you'll be able to tell me that this is what order? That's correct, the Doric order. The big, thick, mass, massive capital that you really can see, followed by really undecorated body going down that's going down in fairly straight lines with a little bit a fluting that takes place on the down and no base. Those are the hallmark features that we're going to see in a Doric column. The whole overarching then, of course, the word you're going to have to know here from the capital all the way down is the idea of column. And you probably already know this from earlier um, classes that you've taken. And each column then, depending upon the size, most pieces of marble, and most of this is made of marble, most of these are actually broken up in different capacities. And so those individual pieces that form a column are individual pieces of marble that are called a drum. And so we'll have multiple drums forming a column. It's decorated by a capital. And then all the way on the top, don't worry about the triglyphs. That's just basically three lines here, tri for three, glyph for writing. So it's just those three columns. But we will want to have you emphasize two more words. One is going to be the freeze. The frieze is this area right here. As you can see, it's this area all the way over. So it includes both the metopes and the triglyphs. It's basically where you tell stories of the gods or of whatever the temple is about. The other thing is the individual stories themselves are called metopes. Note, metopes are just narrative registers from Mesopotamia. They just happen to be separated by triglyphs. So the metopes are actually those narrative registers which will tell you a part of the story almost like a comic book. And the last thing at the very top, the tympanum. Um, and basically what that tympanum um, is, is an area that is decorated where we also tell part of the story of whatever god, goddess, or whatever the building is designed for. Now, when we look at, let me lose that. When we look at the building, there is a fair amount of math, even though there's going to be some optical illusions that are included here. That fair amount of math. So you're going to need to know three different variables in any Greek temple, and that will allow you to make any other Greek temple. The first is going to be your independent variables, your three the things that you get to manipulate. And as soon as you manipulate those things, your dependent variables then actually come into play. Your independent variables in Greek architecture, the first one is going to be the type of column whether you choose a Doric column as seen here, or whether you choose an Ionic, more decorative column. Once you choose that, the proportions of the temple are set. For a Doric column, the proportions are one to seven. For an Ionic column, they're going to be one to eight, one to eight, and we'll talk about that later. Um, the next thing up is the diameter of the column, how fat the column is. Once you create the diameter of the column, based upon the proportion of the temple we saw before from the type of column, you're going to turn the height of the column. So let's say you want to choose a Doric column, Doric being one-seventh proportions of the temple, as you can see here. So I'm going to choose a Doric one-seventh column. If I take the diameter of the column and I say I want the diameter column to be, well, the diameter of the column is going to be 10 feet. So if I have 10 feet and a Doric column, which is one-seventh, that means 10 times 7, the height of the actual column is going to be 70 feet tall. If I wanted to make the column only eight feet wide, eight times seven, it's only going to be 56 feet tall. So once you determine the type of column and the diameter of the column, you basically have your column height and your width already set up. The number of columns then is the next one. You're gonna determine the number of columns that you wanna have in the front. The number of columns that you wanna have in the front, do you have four columns in the front? You have four columns in the front, and normally they did use odd numbers, so let's use five. Um, so let's say we have five columns in the front then the number of columns on the side is going to be 5x plus 1. 5 times 2 is 10, plus 1 is 11. If I wanted 8 columns on the front, that would be 8 times x. That's going to be 16, plus 1. I'm going to have 17 columns on the side. So once you determine these three independent variables, the Greek column and the Greek 
building becomes very easy for the dependent variables with simple math. From the White House basketball court, is President Obama wishing you to study the greatest artworks of all time? Thank you, former President Obama. I'm hoping you were able to hear. He was wish wishing, wishing us um, good studies over one of the great 100 artworks of all time from the White House basketball court, which I'm sure he's probably no longer at. And so this artwork has changed the world. This is the Parthenon. It's from Greece. No, it doesn't take that long to make. It goes up from 447 to 432 BCE. And the architects here are Ictinos and Calicrates. And so we will look at this artwork a little bit. The, one of the major features that shows up on the very top is the following. This is one of the first buildings, actually it is the first building that is ever dedicated to democracy. And that's going to be part of what the message of this, this particular building is. Now, there are some political ide ideologies that are built into the Parthenon itself. And there's really two of them. The Parthenon was built largely because the ancient Greeks had won a major batter, battle. They had won a major battle against the Persians in the Persian Wars. And basically they have become the world superpower or one of the world superpowers as the Persian now, the Persian empire was now in decline. And so one of the things that's going to be emphasized here is that the political ide ideologies expressed in the Parthenon is it's a triumph of democratic Greece over Persia. They were illustrating that, look, we are better than this other culture. We are better because of our democracy. We are better because of our gods. And so that leads us to the next point at the bottom. It's the triumph of the enlightened Greeks over despotism and barbarism. Remember, they, have, they had a divine monarchy. They had an individual that believed he was a living God. And the Greeks are saying, well, free men making free decisions on whether to go to war and what to do if someone attacks us are way better than someone that is actually fighting for an emperor. We are fighting for our own individual freedom. We are fighting for our wives. We are fighting for our families. And they thought that was very much better. And so in the aftermath of the Persian Wars, there's really no other army on earth that's going to attack the Greeks, unless it's Greek city-states fighting amongst one another, which they do a lot of. Remember, these individuals don't get along. The Athenians and the Spartans do not like one another, and they actually make fun of one another. The Athenians making fun of the Spartans for child abuse by beating their children when they're eight and nine to make them strong warriors. The Spartans make fun of the Athenians for being boy lovers, meaning the idea of pedastry, that they have these bisexual relations, sometimes with 14 and 15 year old boys that were considered men according to the ancient Athenian world. But the Spartans just said that is, that's terrible. Why would you do that? And so we, we, we're gonna have some challenges that show up. The Parthenon goes up then in the aftermath of the Persian War. There was a lot of money that actually they would no longer have to spend raising an army for an international conquest of such a giant empire. And so the Parthenon initially, the very back of it, was used actually as a treasury where they kept the money that they were saving from all the different city-states in case they ever had to go to war again. There is an apocryphal tale. So this is a common tale, but we do not know if it's actually accurate, but this is the story that's been handed down and it explains the marathon today. It's called the birth of the marathon. There was a, a runner and actually a warrior. His name is Phidippides. His name you can see over here, Phidippides. He was a Greek soldier. He ran from the town of Marathon to Athens, which is exactly 26.2 miles, to announce that the Persians had been miraculously, miraculously defeated in the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE. After proclaiming this message, he collapsed dead from exhaustion. And supposedly, that distance, which is exactly the distance of a marathon, is the exact beginning of the first marathon. So the first person to ever finish a marathon, we literally can say is Phidippides. If you ever want a really challenging marathon, because it's a very hilly culture, a very hot climate, the, they do still run this marathon um, every year in ancient Greece, from Marathon to Athens. And so it's a historical marathon. This battle of Marathon or Marathona is so important because of the following. If the Greeks lose the Persian and Greek wars, which were taking place then, it is likely that the Persians would have taken over all of Greece and really continued on into Europe. Rome probably does not happen. So the, it's so important that this would have ended the very beginning birthplace of Western civilization, 
which becomes Christian civilization, which becomes American and European civilization and the modern day world. So if the Greeks do lose this battle, there's a very good shot that you worship the prophet Muhammad later on because it would have been passed down through tradition. Jesus would have never been the savior because the Roman warriors would have never happened. And there's a good shot you'd be speaking Arabic today. So there are certain battles that have such significance in world history. This is one of those. Here's a reconstruction of what we are doing actually as we're rebuilding the Parthenon in ancient Greece on the top of the Acropolis. Please note that there is color. It's not just all white. And you can see the interior and the exterior with those beautiful Doric columns on the outside. Now, not to be outdone from our previous lectures, we actually have to look at our lovely spear bearer here by Polyclitus. And that is largely because, as I mentioned, human body architecture, the human, the body, and the experience matters between architecture. So the Doric column is based upon perfect masculinity in ancient Greece. And who better than our perfect masculinity expert is going to be spear bearer by Polyclitus. So the head to the body ratio in spear bearer note is one seventh. It's the exact same thing as the one seventh Doric, Doric column head width. That is a direct relation because of perfection enlarging the head. So these columns are supposed to represent spear bearer. So what should they be about? Masculine strength, calm, cool, collected, army ready to fight, police ready to go, fire department ready to go. Why? Because spear bearer is all of those things. So the way that this works is that the width of the column is one seventh the height, the mathematical equation I said before for the independent and dependent variable. So if you want the, the width across to be 10 feet, they're 70 feet tall. And generally they are pretty good at keeping with this average as they goes up. And remember, capital means head in this particular part of the world in Greece. And so the capital right here is very thick, just like he's got an enlarged head here. Note it's muscular. So we have this muscle going down that shows up. Then there's the second independent or dependent variable or the relationship of the independent variable. The independent, the number of the front columns, in this case we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight columns in the front, times one, so that means we're going to have two x plus one, 17 columns on the side, and once again, no base in any capacity that shows up. So that's what we are ultimately looking at. Now this is supposed to be about masculine dominant presence, and if you look at it, we have two lovely people walking in to our Parthenon here, the Reconstruction in Nashville, Tennessee, they would barely fit in it together. Why? This is because this is a military phalanx that's literally there. I've got my body here. I've got my friend's body here. I've got my friend. It's about masculine presence and dominance. It's basically saying, don't F with us. So this is a military monument because we want a military war. So we're going to use dominant military masculine columns. Here in the United States, we don't see those masculine dominant columns all that often. Because here in the United States, we, almost all of our buildings, even our government buildings, we want to actually have that men and women are going to be involved with. So we do see these dominant Doric columns and variations of the Doric columns here on the Pentagon. We see them on Soldier Field in Miami, which is dedicated to football and World War II Veterans Memorial. But we don't see it very often. The column that we're more likely to see, well, actually, I should point out one more time. You'll also, notice, you'll also notice on Zeus's sculpture, or Zeus's um, temple, here we have lovely, a variation of Doric columns. They're right there. Why? This is Zeus at Olympia. This is where we're gonna have masculine sport and where all war ends and it's dedicated to Zeus, the high God, the male God, the military God that watches over everything. Here we have actually what's left of that temple at Zeus. And there's that sacred, lovely olive tree that we saw from the Olympics that you have rather than a gold medal for the winner only do you get a wreath made out of that olive tree. Now inside, inside of the Zeus chapel that has those Doric columns or inside the Doric um, temple that is the Parthenon that's right behind me, you are going to find the greatest sculptor ever, his artworks. And that's Phidias, or sometimes pronounced Phidias. 
the greatest sculptor ever. Here's an image of him working on the friezes and the sculptural decoration around the Parthenon. Remember, we have ivory and gold, 40 foot tall statue, remarkable accomplishment, which no longer exists. And later is going to be our, become the model for our Lincoln Memorial and later for God sitting in throne, very formulaic that we have. We're going to have the Athena over here in the Parthenon. So here we have the Athena also here with gold and ivory. Note much more gold with the gown, even in terms of this lovely shield here with Medusa on it. That shield was made of solid gold and it's about 10 feet tall. So we're talking about resplendent wealth here. And remember, Athena is the goddess of wisdom and war. And you, for those of you who don't know, Athens is named for the goddess Athena. I'll show you an image later on on why this is. She had a battle with the goddess um, Poseidon over who Athena or over who should be the patron saint of Athena. That's actually on the sculptural frieze. Remember the architectural decoration on the outside of the Parthenon. This is about the amount of ivory that you would actually need to make either the Zeus or of the Athena. And so one of the mythbusters I want to bring up with you as you think through it is that, and I've mentioned this once before, the ancient civilizations did not live in peace and harmony with their environments. They did not. Just like we today, they wanted to dominate every aspect of their environment. And so the artworks that change the world is the interior as well as the exterior of the Parthenon. Remember, the Parthenon is the Doric masculine calm, men protecting like the phalanx and powerful and the one seven, all these things that show up, the two X plus one for the number of columns. The inside is much more feminine. So the inside, as you notice, different type of columns. Here we have our lovely Ayana columns. Note the capital, it's not nearly as thick at the top. Why? The capital right here and the capital, these are the volumes, so that's not even the capital. The capital is that little tiny area there, that little tiny area there, that little tiny, see how you can barely see it? It's almost like a shadow. That is her head, right? Her relations or her, her proportions are one eighth. She's got an itty bitty head. Why? Women were not seen as that smart. They didn't have that kind of logic. That's why we also don't give them the right to vote. Remember Aristotle, actually, who's one of the greatest men during this time period ever, made the huge mistake of assuming that women had very little control over their emotions, very little control over their logic, and therefore did not have the right to vote, but really could understand logic, but not produce it themselves. That was the realm of men. And we used art and made male heads larger to emphasize this and really promote this. Even though men don't have larger heads, proportionally, it's still one eighth for almost everyone. Now, when we look at the ionic column that we see, right here. I'm going to move myself out of the way again. The Ionic column. Note a few things that happen. First off, the tiny little capital up here, tiny like the woman's tiny little head, emphasizing she's not that bright. Note the decorated volutes are going to represent female breasts. See the circles here on the female breast? Note, right underneath the tiny little head, what do you have? You have the breast area that's going to show up for women. The next, we're going to have one eighth high head to body proportion. So note, these columns are going to be much farther apart. There's more room, there's more airiness. Why this is not about protection. This is more like the muses. It's about the idea of a beautiful space. So it's actually where we're going to get the idea of even today, oftentimes we'll use um, ionic columns on the interior of museums. It's more spacious, but it also, it's about inspiration of beauty and love and the graces that will show up. The one eighth with the height ratio of the column. Remember in the male, we saw one seven. And the women's going to be one eighth. So they're going to be much more slender, much more beautiful decorative columns that we're going to have, even with lovely shapes on the very top, like the volutes. So the idea that shows up here is that if the column happens to be, let's take 10 to make it easy again, 10 feet across, and it's eight in one eighth of proportion, you take 10 times eight, it's 10 feet across, it's 80 feet tall. And so we're going to get much more slender, gorgeous proportions. You can even see it in the image here. We're going to have a decorated base as if she's wearing sandals or beautiful feet. Um, and also the column, rather than coming down very perpendicular, it's going to swell right around the hip section. So this is called entasis, E-N-T-A-S-I-S. -S. It's supposed to be the swelling, beautiful hips, childbearing hips that are going to show up. So basically we have taken the female body and we have put it into an ionic column 
which then emphasize the, the, the more feminine rain. And this is what we're going to use largely in a lot, for a lot of our architecture when we do decide to use column. It's a much more beautiful column. So that's the column that we have at the top with the tiny little capital all the way up there, the volutes on the decoration for the breast going down, the body then that actually swells out with the intasis and a woman wearing shoes or is up on a platform. That's what we see on the inside of the Parthenon. So it's a combination of masculine and, and forceful on the inside and beautiful protection. The same way that women were supposed to stay at home, raise children, and so our gender roles, even in architecture, are coming up with the Parthenon, the building that was first dedicated to democracy. Where would you expect to see Ionic columns today? All over museums. So this is the Field Museum in Chicago. The, the most famous dinosaur in the world is probably Sue the T-Rex. Um, I was actually working there on the opening day of Sue the T-Rex, which was a very cool thing. So there you know, you'll see the lovely Ionic columns. You can see the head and the capital sticking out there. We're gonna have different variations of them depending upon what side of the White House we go to as well. The other side will be Corinthian and we'll deal with them even though they were invented by the Greeks during the Roman periods, because they're the one who used them the most. Now, whenever you see those Doric or Ionic columns, come on, whenever you see those Doric or Ionic columns, you have to assume that you are actually looking at a building in an area that is dominated by democracy. So when you think of Doric and Ionic columns and when you see them, you'll generally see them a lot in the United States, you'll see them a lot in Western Europe and France and um, in England, in Denmark, in Spain, in Germany. Um, it basically means that that government or those buildings, they're a testament to the ancient Greek way of life. We're paying homage to the ancient Greek way of life. The individuals who invented museum and um, art as a master, but also democracy. And so generally you will not find too many columns that look like this almost ever in China. They're not a democracy. They've never been a democracy. So why would they take on those characteristics? They have their own government buildings with their own government meetings. Now, wherever the odd part though, is wherever the colonizers went, the colonizers, particularly white Western Europeans, um, the Spanish, the English, the Dutch, the French, the Germans, when they were colonizing other parts of the world, they often brought their colonial architecture. So for example, if you go to Nigeria, you'll see a fair number of English style democracy, Greek architecture, because that's what they brought there. We'll find the same thing in India, which actually has become a modern day democracy, because even though they have their own cultural beautiful references, they often will combine those with the columns, particularly the Ionic columns, because men and women are both involved in their democracy. I mean, interesting, we often talk about how forward thinking the United States is in terms of our gender politics, and we are versus much of the rest of the world, but we're one of the few major nations in the world that has never had an elected female prime minister or president. India's had two, Germany's had two, the United Kingdom's had at least one, Spain, France, they've all had female heads of state and the United States is the one that has not. And so this slide is an interesting slide because what I want you to do as you think through the Parthenon, and I'm gonna show you an image here of this in a moment, is can you make out the optical illusions? The, ba the, the basic notion here is the following. There are no, direct straight lines in the Parthenon. You might not be able to see it because your eye corrects for those things and makes them look straight. And that's exactly what the Greeks wanted you to do. So this is considered one of the two or three most beautiful buildings in the world. And it's because your eye corrects, or the building I should say, corrects for the problems with your eye. So for example, if we look at a long series of columns going back into the distance, like here, long series of columns. What your eye does is your eye naturally makes the middle column sag a little bit. It's just how we see the world. So the Greeks knew this. So how did they accommodate this? They made the columns on the middle section a little bit taller to counteract that. And so this is all an optical illusion and eye trade. So if we actually look at the way the optical illusions work, this is what the optical illusions would look if we were to draw out the Parthenon. And note, everything curves. So here's what the Parthenon looks like up close. You really start looking, here's the view from a distance. The spacing of the columns is even off. The view from a distance is that they're all equal. Here's an overview drawing that shows up. It's a very weird thing. So if we go back, when I was moving here to Miami from Chicago, take the job, 
um, with Miami Dade College and my wife, as we mentioned before, is a professor over at FIU. One of the things that we did is we stopped at, at this Nashville Parthenon. We hadn't seen it before. It's about a half day trip. It was a good trip for the kids. My kids were fascinated with Percy Jackson. They loved Greek culture and mythology. And so we stopped here and my wife and I sat right here. And I told the kids because I knew the tricks. And I told my wife, hey, watch this. This will be interesting. So my little guys, my children were nine and seven at the time. So they trusted daddy. So they are running back and I say, hey, go measure how many feet is between here. And so my, you see my little son walking and putting his feet down. My daughter does the same thing. They come back. My son's like, oh, dad, it's eight. And my daughter's like, it's seven because she's a little bit older. And so she would have bigger feet within the process. I said, all right, go halfway down. And they ran halfway down. They counted the column. They're like, all right, we're at column 17. That's all the way at the end. So we're in column nine. And they figure it out. And my son comes back. And he's like, dad, it's not seven anymore. It's like nine. What happened? And I said, go measure it again. They went and measured it again. Again, we're just getting him some exercise because we're going to be in the car for another 13 hours to make it to Miami. He comes back and he was sure of it. I said, all right, this is weird. Go the way, all the way at the end. And I turned around and I told my wife, I said, watch this. We'll be interesting. So my kids start running. They make it to the halfway point and my wife notes nothing. Then as soon as they make it past that, that ninth column, my kids start disappearing because the way the Parthenon is, is that it goes up on the side to a slight little hill and then it starts coming down. So my kids had reached the top of the hill here and now as they ran down, they were starting to disappear. And so all the way at the end, when they turn around and all we see is my daughter's head. My little guy, my son, who was smaller already, he was actually, he disappeared. He wasn't there. And then all of a sudden we saw his hand start jumping up behind. Hi, Dad, I'm here. Like, and so the, the shape of the Parthenon itself, all of it is an optical illusion that makes you look. Now, it was on the top of the Acropolis, which means you could only approach it by wandering up the hill one way and approaching it from the front. So no one would have ever noticed these discrepancies from below because you could only enter the temple from the front. Here in Nashville, it's not a hilly environment at all. So you can actually go and see, if you really look, you can see these weird optical illusions and how they work. That's the one that's why I show this one here. If you look really close, you can start to see the curvature. Note right here, that you can probably tell that that no longer, now that you know what you're looking for, that that is no longer straight. You probably can tell that this is no longer straight. And I'm sure you can tell, look, that the columns don't stand up straight. Look at that column. Look at this column. They clearly are leaning in within the process. Now it's very slight. If we were to draw a line, they would eventually meet three and a half miles above the earth. So it's slight, but it's there. And each one had a functional. They're either for water, they're for structural support, uh, but they're also there to be perfect for the eye and not for mathematics. It's one of the reasons the Romans are in their architecture, which is mathematically perfect for next week, is going to make fun of the, the Greek way of making the world. It is going to be based upon the golden ratio. And so the golden ratio is that most perfect um, number that we have. It's very pleasing to the eye. We see it all over nature in seashells. Um, it's also called a Fibonacci sequence. If you don't know the Fibonacci sequence is what the golden ratio describes. If you take the two numbers before, so Fibonacci sequence would be one plus one is two. So two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight. 8 plus 5 is 13, so it's the two previous sums actually added together, and if you map that chart, you get the Fibonacci golden rule, golden ratio sequence, which even da Vinci uses in the Mona Lisa. It is just inherently pre-pleasing, and then the, the mathematical equivalent of that is 1.618. We're going to see the Greek architecture and the golden mean all over. We see it in da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. We're going to see it in the Mona Lisa. And we see it all over nature, including in many people's own fingerprints. It's a naturally recurring pattern. Now, one of the things that happens is with the outside decoration. The outside decoration represents something called the panathenaea. And that's the big fancy word up here, the panathenaea. And that is when a new peplos dress, a new garb for Athena was actually brought. Now, clearly you're not going to change out a gold dress, but it was a symbolic gesture that happened every few years. And so you can actually see here is basically what's going to happen on the outside of the Panathenaea. I'm gonna show you a couple of these images. One of them is going to be this one. 
It's going to show you show the birth of Athena herself. If you don't know the birth of Athena, who's the goddess of wisdom and intelligence, specifically in war, she was inside of Zeus's head. So here's the birth of Athena. And we can tell it took a whole day for Zeus to get Athena out of her head because here we have the rising sun and here we have the setting sun. Horse-drawn chariots basically leading for the rising and the setting sun over a day. And note, this is on one of the triangular areas, the Tipanon, up here. And so that's what we actually see is the birth of Athena. Now, Athena was in Zeus's head and was born that way because, uh, uh, unfortunately, Zeus, being not that great a husband, at least in momentary lapses over and over and over again, met a beautiful woman named Metis. And Metis got pregnant after having an encounter with, with Zeus. Zeus was told that the, the child would actually overthrow Zeus. And so in order to get rid of that child, Zeus ate Metis and the unborn fetus, which eventually caused a headache. That headache that came out was the god of wisdom and war, Athena trying to get out and poking him in headache. So when he actually gets that out, the headache ends, and he also is not destroyed by his child then from within. On the other side, the west pediment, the other side of the Parthenon is this. And this is the battle between, in this case, Athena and Poseidon, trying to prove to the Athenians who should be the patron saint of Athens. So Athena does something amazing. She gives them an olive tree. Remember the symbolic aspect of the olive tree, not only for trade, but there's not a lot of good farmland, but also even in terms of the, the reef for the Olympics and the relation there. Poseidon, on the other hand, decides he's god of the sea. He raises his trident, produces some salt water or a horse. In this case, you can actually see a horse showing up, but a single horse for the Athenian population. They're not that interested. And salt water, they live on the ocean. What do they need more salt water for? And so the they, um, ancient Athenians all resound and say Athens should be named, or Athens should be named Athens in, in the honor, and the patron saint should be Athena. Now, the controversy that shows up around our lovely Parthenon, as you'll notice at the very top, and I uh, will stop share to show you for a moment, the very top, note, all the decoration is gone. Over time, and after the, the Greek empire fell, this building, as you can see, fell into disrepair. And a lot of the artworks themselves fell down and actually ended up in the rubble over here. Now, When this happens, these artworks are actually collected by other individuals, particularly by a, a British individual hundreds of years later. His name is Elgin or Elgin, Lord Elgin, E-L-G-I-N. And the, he brings them into, oh, takes a moment actually to load this up again. He brings these lovely marbles. They actually are still called the Elgin marbles today. There we go, the Elgin marbles. E-L-G-I-N, he brings it to the British Museum, and they still stand in the British Museum, even though originally from Greece and from the Parthenon. And this brings us to the level and the question, which is an interesting question in the modern day world, who should own the rights to world arts? So the 10 greatest museums in the world are all in Caucasian countries. And guess what? Because the Caucasian countries were the dominant colonizers and are on top in world history, politics, economics today, your United States, your France, England, Spain, Denmark, Germany, that's where the greatest museums are. And so they have the greatest collection of art that they took from other nations. Now, it's not really considered stealing, why? Right? Because in order to be stealing, it has to be legally defined as stealing. And guess who wrote the laws saying that it wasn't stealing when we took other people's arts? That's right, these other colonizing nations that show up. So one of the things that shows up, particularly in my field of African art, which is my specialty, is the best collection of African art anywhere in the world is where? Does anyone have any idea? And that is actually an interesting fact. The best collection of African art in the entire world is owned by the Walt Disney World Company. One of the best collections you will ever be able to see, it's free once you get a trip up there, is in the Animal Kingdom Lodge. That is one of the great African art museums on the planet. I know. See the label copy here? This is actually an Igbo Ijele masquerade from Nigeria. Ijele means image of the world. So it's supposed to have everything 
that local village knows about the world they put on top of this mask. And this is a 18 foot tall mask. This rests on a guy's head, six feet tall. It's an amazing, amazing performance. If you ever have the opportunity to see one of these get performed somewhere. So an Ebo Ejele mask. They have about 250 different artifacts all laid out from all over Africa there. Well, guess what? Africa would like to have those artworks back, just the same way that Greece wants the Elgin marbles back over here. And so it's a sticking point on who should own the right to arts. For those of you that are Cuban, what's the best collection or the best collection of Cuban art in the world? Anyone have any idea where that might be from or where it is currently? It's not in Cuba. It's actually in Spain. And then after Spain, they have the next collection is in New York City and then here in Miami. And so, but think about the number of Cubans that are able to travel, A, either afford it or be able to get visas to go back and forth between these countries to see their own cultural heritage. It is a real sticking point in world history. Now, part of it becomes the following. Who should own the rights to world arts? Well, if we look at colonial expansion throughout history, and you can actually see who has owned what, but tiny little nations here, like the Blue Nation owns the United States, that's the British Empire, we see the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the French and English Empire. You can see, basically, these colors here are dominated all the way around the rest of the world. At some point, this little area of the world's population, Europe, owned more than 75% of the world and its population and controlled them in many different aspects. It's a major issue that shows up. So at the end of World War II, we were faced with a challenge. The challenge we were faced with is this. We knew what a bad guy Hitler was. We knew the, the, the atrocities and the disaster that he had actually committed. And we didn't want him had to have the art. If you know, Hitler was a great, great, great art collector. Kind of like Napoleon, when he went on his adventures through Egypt, he brought innumerable artworks back. That's why one of the great collections of Egyptian art um, in the entire world is actually at the Louvre. That was Napoleon's art museum. It was actually his palace and later on his art museum. So who should own the rights to these world arts today? We want to make sure Hitler did it. And so we passed the law. And basically we, the allied powers created, if you look below, what was called the London Declaration of 1943. And it declared that the allies would invalidate any transfers of looted cultural treasures from the territories of occupation by the Axis powers. Summaries. So the summary of this was this. The Allies, the Allies in World War II, remember, are us, France, England, and Russia. We can take any artworks that we want, and the Axis powers can. That way Germany did not get the artwork. Hitler did not get the artwork. Now, this is arbitrary and ridiculous, because it's white people making laws for other white people. So we're basically saying on this, Hitler, no art for you. Hirohito, Japan, no art for you. Mussolini from Italy and the the Axis powers, no art for you. Stalin, great dictator, later on going to kill 25 million people or in the process of killing 25 million people. Yeah, take whatever you want. That's ridiculous. So the international law that we ultimately passed was this. It recognized the ownership of an artwork as of January 1st, 1921. So basically it guarantees Axis powers looted its goods for return. In reality, it basically says that powerful victorious nations at the end of World War II wrote cultural rules to benefit themselves. Now we have to consider that date that's on right here, January 1st, 1921. That means that if you illegally stole something on December 31st at 1159 p.m. in 1920, the artwork was yours. Legally, it was yours by definition. That's a crazy statement. We had to set the rule somewhere rather than just giving it all back or do we, because here's the problem. In 1921, that is the high period of the colonial empire. That is when we end up with things such as England owns India. They own half of Africa. France owns half of Africa. We have still the Spanish with dominions in many parts of the new world. So if they took it before 1921, it was theirs. So basically white people wrote, and white people, basically the European nations uh, and the United States, wrote a law that basically said international law is that if you had this artwork in 1920, when you were the dominant world power, you get to keep it forever, no matter how you got it. So let me show you a very sad case. 
one of my saddest cases, in fact. I used to be um, an education director at the Field Museum of Chicago, one of the great art museums in the world, generally considered the fifth best anthropology collection in the entire world. And I got to work every year with 100,000 kids, 20,000 teachers on how to get them to understand the world at large. One of the people that I met, actually I met them in Nigeria from a previous work with some United Nations work, but one of the people that I met and actually got to work with at least once a year is this individual right here. One of my friends, he died um, a number of years ago. His son now rules the kingdom of Benin. So this is Akenzua II, and he's the Oba, that is the Bini or the Benin name for his people. The artwork all the way on the left, that is a reconstruction, it's not the real one, but that is a reconstruction of his ancestral altar. Remember from Egyptian culture, we talked about 72% of the world's population believe in ancestral figures. They are 10 to 100 times more powerful, and they actually intercede on behalf of you with the gods to make the world and the country better. Well, in 1897, this individual's great-great-great-grandfather, Kenzoe II's great-great-great-grandfather, was worshiping for three days in his temple. And the Europeans, specifically the British, came knocking at the door. They were not going to wait for three um, days for this African black man to do what they consider basically voodoo worship when he was worshiping his ancestors. So they, with their military, barged in. There was only four or five of them. They barged in during this ceremony. Unfortunately, the only punishment that can be given to those British men for barging in and thinking it was more important that that they see um, the 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 Oba, the king of Benin, than the king of Benin performing his ancestral rites was death. And so the Bini Oba put these five individuals to death because he interrupted the ancestral spirits and that's what had been done for generations. Well the Europeans would have none of this. The British found out what happened. No surprise they weren't trying to hide it. They sent back the remains, they explained the situation but the British would have none of it. So they sent an entire military force. They took over the palace. They took over the Benin Empire, and they took the artwork that's on the left and all the artworks that were next to it, because there was many ancestral altars. They took it all and basically took it back to England. So they took all of their ancestral rights. This is called the Benin Punitive Expedition from 1897. They were avenging, revenging five of their citizens' death who really broke the law in another culture because they couldn't wait the three days being white people. And so ultimately what happens is now these artworks are scattered and were sold off and spread all over the world. Now, my part within this process, I got a letter from Akenzo II begging me to try to help him because the owners and the, the people who ran the Field Museum in Chicago with these particular rites and with these ancestral figures have some of them on display, not all of them, but some of them on display. And so Akenzo II and now his son have to travel around the world to perform ancestral worship rites, which they have to do at least once a year, and normally they would do once a month, he has to go to 15 different museums to see his own ancestral um, heritage, his own ancestral figures, his own ancestral forces, their Ka spirits, however you want to phrase it, their soul forces. And so I had to leave Akenzo II an individual that I knew and apologized profusely because he was allowed to look at the object behind glass, but he wanted to pour wine and libations and clean them and honor them, really like holding your ancestor, holding your grandfather. And of course, the Western Museum said, no, we're not going to allow you to do that. So he would go and perform prayers right in front of it with some incense and some smoke that he would hope that would actually get in and infuse the material, but he was never allowed to touch the material. And this is the situation that we have with cultural artworks when basically white Europeans wrote the laws that if you owned an artwork before January 1st, 1921, that artwork was yours. During the colonial period, we took all this artwork by hook, by crook, by stealing, by however you want to call it. And that's true of most of all of your heritage artwork. That'd be true of Cuban, of Haitian, Brazilian, Venezuelan, Colombian, those best collections of art. If you want to go see this, you're going to have to go to a foreign nation which is much more expensive to go to, and many local populations can't afford to go see them. That's why the great museums of the world are in these white nations. It's all from the colonial period. And there is a real sticking point where people from other parts of the world believe their cultural heritage is robbed. 
We have the same problem with the Parthenon. Guess what? The Greeks want their artwork back. And the British are saying, no, you signed on the law. The law was from 1921. Um, we had them before then with the Elgin marbles. We have document and documentation. We have them beforehand. So we're going to keep them. Now with Brexit and um, Greece being a member of the European Union, Greece is saying, no, 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 no. We're going to play hardball with, with Britain. We're going to force them to give back and you can find this in the news on the internet or on just Google um, Brexit and the Elgin marbles and it will show up. Greece is trying to force um, Britain to try to give these monuments back because they believe it's their cultural theory. It's their democracy. Britain says, no, 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 1920 to, to the, the victor goes the spoils in the early history of art. And that has basically been true all the way up until 1921 when we really rewrote the law so Hitler couldn't take the great art collection that he had amassed. Napoleon, he gets to keep his art collection. So this does lead me to an interesting job, a great job. Actually, I love this job. Sometimes I'm sorry I left this job because I got to work with some of the greatest artifacts in the world. I mean, sometimes I got to work with dinosaurs. In fact, if you see, where is it? there's a little bone right here that I actually got to place on that dinosaur. One of the most famous dinosaurs in the world is Sue. I got to work with ancient America, got to work with mummies, a career opportunity then was working in museum education in, tar in terms of a museum. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're educating all levels of the public on the impact and the importance of different art artists, artworks, artists. Um, one of my favorite things to do is gallery walks where we walk around, we talk about, oh, here we have this particular object and here's how it was used. Here's the references in the modern day world because what we now know, which should not surprise us, humanity, we're all very similar. We have common concerns. We all care about healthcare. We all care about education. We all care about um, the idea of living a long, prosperous, happy life of not being violated. So we just have different responses, different government institutions, different amount of resources that happen to be there, different amount of food that grows wild, depending on how hard we have to work. And so we have different, so the Field Museum's motto was common concerns, different responses. And so the starting salary of working at a museum somewhere it's about $45,000 now for, and it generally involves a master's. You would be a master's in one particular field of working in a museum. And this would be true of almost any kind of museum education department and do help facilitate people understanding what that museum is presenting because there's a fair number of individuals that would rather be told rather than read. And so that's what a museum uh, educator actually does. Sometimes it's hands-on education. We need to handle dinosaur bones and and sometimes actually even bring out models of dinosaur bones. Sometimes like I do in class, I have some of those objects. Like I, if for Egypt, I brought you around the little canopic jars with the jackal head so you could actually see that. That's kind of what a museum educator does and explains why they're important. So there's another job for you to consider. And before we end then, we can also try the challenge A to Z degrees. Think of an artwork, personality, invention, or aesthetic from each letter of the alphabet about ancient Greece. We only have one lecture to go in ancient Greece, and that's going to be on theater because if men are always behaving like this and don't have an emotional release, eventually they are going to have a mental breakdown and do something very violent, either to their enemies, which they're already uber violent to, or to their wives, to their spouses. We do need this emotional release, this catharsis, and so we're going to have that for the male body finally in our next lecture at Greek theater. Have a wonderful day. I hope everyone is doing well. And the last thing that we're going to do, or give you an opportunity to do in class, is design a Greek temple to a specific god using Greek standards. Remember, consider the type of columns. Do you want to make a masculine or a feminine column? Do you want to make the Doric or do you want to make the Ionic? Do you want to make the spear bearer or the Aphrodite model? What's the height going to be? Because as soon as you know the diameter of the column or the height, you can work backwards. And remember, the number of columns on the front, the ones on the side are going to be 2x plus 1. If you know that basic piece of information and what god you want to make from, you can do any Greek column or any Greek um, temple in the world. That's what we're looking at. Greek architecture today, we still have it. As you can see, we have the Doric column outside the Lincoln Memorial. We're going to have Corinthian column, which we haven't talked about yet, but it were in your video. They are in, in, invented in Greece in the ancient city of Corinth, but they're really going to be used by the Romans. So remember, when you see Doric column, think masculine strength, but also think democracy. If you see Ionicon, think Max, so I think feminine beauty and grace, um, often in museums or in buildings for politics where we want men and women to come together, but it's also democracy. 
Corinthian columns, we're going to have to look at the ancient Roman Empire and really talk much more about Republic in the future, like on our US Supreme Court justice. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the share. Have a wonderful day.